obviously i have no limit when i get angry and like obviously he said that i need help with that because people are generally saying to me one of you are going to end up dead like and i fully believe that i'm quite capable of killing him or i'm gonna end up being in prison these are the disturbing words spoken by an OnlyFans model just several weeks before she murdered her boyfriend. There were many warning signs given to those living around the couple, and although some measures were put in place, not enough was done to quash her terrible behaviour. But who exactly is Abigail White? What were the triggers behind her actions? And how did it all end for the murderous mother of four? Welcome or welcome back to Coffee House Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the case of Bradley Lewis and Abigail White. With Christmas fast approaching, I've made a few changes to the coffee house around me, and so with that said, I hope you don't mind the festive decor. And of course, just to let you know that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that is your sort of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffee House Crime. Now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Abigail White. Well, this island sure seems familiar. Welcome back to the United Kingdom, folks, and more specifically, the city of Bristol. If ever there was a place with a story to tell, it is this one right here. Enveloped in the hills of southwest England, it has its own unmistakable identity, carved out by passionate locals and devoted fans alike. Straddling the River Avon, the port city is now a cultural hub that serves as a major stakeholder in the manufacturing and financial industry, as well as being home to many university students and a massively diverse range of people from various walks of life. The aerospace industry remains as an essential sector of the local economy, where many companies such as BAA Systems, Rolls-Royce and Airbus operate. Interesting fact, but Bristol is the only big city whose wealth per capita is higher than that of Britain as a whole. And with a highly skilled workforce drawn from its universities, Bristol claims to have the largest cluster of computer chip designers and manufacturers outside of Silicon Valley. Like the people of many other major cities and towns across the UK, the residents of Bristol fall into a very similar pattern of quintessentially British behaviour. We all love our tea and scones, sport a very firm handshake, and love to complain about many things, such as our economy, the weather, and of course, bad traffic. Thank God for that! I bet they're old! I bet they're old! They're old! But Bristolians are also known to be more friendly than the national average. Which isn't that difficult, to be brutally honest, as we all seem to be rather stoic here. But this sociable and chipper characteristic can also be used to describe the first subject of today's case. And his name is Bradley Lewis. Born in March 2000 to a loving family, Bradley grew up near Bristol, and his father Steve and mother Rachel were generous folks who prioritised family over all else. Now, like many kids in England, the young and cheerful Bradley was obsessed with football, and while attending St Stephen's Junior School, he played for his local junior club. After finishing school, Bradley took on an apprenticeship as a floor layer in his late teenage years. He was a much-loved young man with a fantastic personality, and his large number of friends reflected on this fact. He was exactly what you'd expect from any young British lad, and that is that he loved his mates, enjoyed goofing around, and could often be found partying. It was at the age of 14 that he caught the eyes of a girl one year his senior. Her name was Abigail White, and after getting to know him, she developed a crush on the boy. And fast forward two years later, the two teens began to date. But Abigail wasn't quite the same as Bradley, and this was partly due to her difficult childhood. When she was only two years old, her father began to violently beat her mother. Things didn't get better after this. When she was only four years old, her mother and father split up, and then when her new stepfather stepped in, he would start to physically abuse her directly. Eventually, she was taken into foster care. Although she then lived safely with her grandparents, her education seemed to be disrupted by her bad behaviour, and she was often excluded from school. And you can maybe predict where this is going, but unfortunately, after developing several mental and emotional issues, she was then prescribed antidepressants at the young age of 13. Moving into her adult years, Abigail's life never normalised. She never sought or obtained a regular job, and instead took up work as a self-employed creator in the lucrative world of OnlyFans. Now, OnlyFans is an internet content subscription service that allows creators to share whatever kind of images they like with their paying fans. And whilst it can be used for numerous different purposes by a variety of creators, it is infamous for being host to a very large number of sex workers. And you can also likely guess what sort of content Abigail chose to engage in. 
dubbing herself the fake Barbie girl, Abigail White, who went by the online name of Mitzi Lewis, began to post content of herself pertaining to the world of adult entertainment. Now, at first, her jump into the world of OnlyFans was a well-paid one, and in the first year alone, Mitzi made just over £50,000 or $60,000. But this wouldn't last, and as the years slipped by, her relevance in the increasingly competitive industry began to decrease, losing around 75% of her audience and revenue to a mere £12,000 a year. Although this wasn't enough to financially support her, Abigail was luckily able to fall back on Bradley and his income, which was crucial, as now they had four young mouths to feed, three of which were his own. But much like her income stream, things were not stable at home either. Abigail was known to dabble with cocaine, and although she claimed not to be alcohol dependent, she would often take things way too far with it. Real mother of the immaterial, right here. And unfortunately, the relationship between her and Bradley was often a turbulent one at best, and in her own words, they were in a very tough and controlling relationship. While she claimed that he was manipulative and unfaithful, she also admitted that she had slept with multiple other men throughout their time together. Which kind of makes sense, because if the two were together since she was 15 years old, and only three of her kids were his, then I don't know how else you'd explain the fourth one. Many friends claimed that the relationship was toxic and possessive, and even warned Bradley that Abigail was a complete psycho. Bradley's mother resented her too, as she knew that her son wasn't being treated correctly and deserved much better. There even came a time when concerns became so strong that the social services stepped into the family household and demanded that Abigail was no longer allowed to live with Bradley. Which was a good precaution to take, but unfortunately was a rule that was often disregarded. You see, although Bradley moved out to live with his mother, Abigail no longer trusted him when he was away from her. And with thanks to her controlling personality, she often manipulated Bradley into coming over and sleeping with her most nights. Stepping into more of the cringy stuff, but Abigail was also nauseatingly egotistical. And despite most of her social media accounts now being deleted, her currently still viewable TikTok account portrays the image of a young mother who takes no account of her actions, and instead makes public posts out of resentment and negativity, as well as fishing for attention from potential subscribers of her OnlyFans account. In one of these videos, Abigail played the notification sound from Tinder, one of the world's most popular dating apps, to see if it would get a rise out of Bradley. Which, if you ask me, is quite a shit thing to do. And although some of the social media posts revealed a glimpse of the cold and ugly truth behind closed doors, she would still try to portray the image of a perfect couple to others. And that is certainly worth highlighting here, as in the artificial and misleading world of social media, you can never be sure of what is happening behind the carefully doctored lens of superficial happiness. Abigail also used her social media accounts to intimidate people she argued with, while also publicly belittling Bradley online. Because you think, like, you you're saying I'm fat? No, at all, but you said it's made for an hour. When it came to personal friendships and relationships, he was often slagged off and criticised. And, of course, if we're talking about personal messages, then came the infamous voice recording to a friend. I can't believe a f word that comes out of that boy's mouth. I have to beat the f living daylights out of him for him to tell me the truth, and he still don't tell me the truth. He only tells me the truth when he thinks I'm gonna f kill him. Like, when I get a knife out. Like, when I f stab him. Like, oh, I just, I just don't get this kid. But... Obviously, I have no limit when I get angry, and like obviously he said that I need help with that because people are generally saying to me, one of you are going to end up dead, like, and I fully believe that I'm quite capable of killing him if he hurts me again, and or I'm going to end up being in prison. Leading up to the actual crime of our case today, it was in the early months of 2021 that the relationship between Abigail and Bradley came to an all-new volatile height. To begin with was the voice recording, but on March the 19th, after quite a bad argument, Abigail took it one step further by actually stabbing him in the arm. Obviously, this caused a massive wound and required medical treatment, but Bradley was a gentle soul and he didn't want to get Abigail in trouble. So when the doctor asked what happened, he covered for her and said it was an accident at work. And although you'd expect, or at least hope, that he'd leave her after this encounter, Bradley unfortunately didn't. 
He felt confined to the relationship because of the children he shared with her. And all of this was despite social services recommending they stay away from each other. Friends and family also urged the two to take some time apart, and those close to them claimed that Abigail was going mad and desperately needed help. And on March the 25th, after all of the warnings, the concerning messages, and the voice notes, the violent relationship would finally reach a brutal and irreversible climax. March 25th, 2021. It was 8pm, and being a Thursday, most families were calmly settling in for the evening. But for the White Lewis family, the atmosphere was very different. At 8.10pm, a distressed scream erupted from the home, and that scream was coming from Abigail. The first person to respond was a neighbour named Mrs. Kundi. Abigail shouted out to say, help, I can't get through. Can someone call the emergency services? He's not breathing. And after running next door, she was met with a harrowing scene. Bradley was lying on his back in the kitchen, with his blood covering the hallway and the living room, and a blood-stained knife lay on the radiator. In a state of panic and shock, Mrs. Kundi dialed 999 immediately. Mrs. Kundi's husband arrived just before authorities did, and then as the paramedics arrived, they commenced medical treatment on Brad. Bloodstains were found throughout the ground floor of the property, and to add to this, they also found a t-shirt, a mop, and several other items of clothing, all covered in blood. Abigail was acting as if she was utterly terrified, and she claimed that Bradley had stabbed himself in protest after a heated argument. But officers were not sold on this idea, as it made no sense as to why Bradley would do such a thing. So, although she was allowed to travel with him to the hospital, they kept a very watchful eye on her. But tragically, even after being rushed into surgery, there was simply nothing they could do to save his life. Bradley had simply lost too much blood, and at 1.30am, he was pronounced dead. Bradley's family were notified when officers arrived on their doorstep, and when they received the devastating news, their world shattered around them. But although Bradley's death was conclusive and final, many questions still remained, all of which now had to be found through the chaotic and confusing fog of unknown. A post-mortem examination of Bradley's body concluded that the cause of his death was a single stab wound to the chest, which then penetrated his thoracic cavity by slicing through a gap between his ribs and ultimately into his heart. But that wasn't the only thing authorities had learned, as witness reports indicated that Bradley's and Abigail's relationship had recently become exceptionally turbulent. Several friends had come forward to report that, allegedly, shortly before his death, Bradley had admitted to having an affair. This apparently angered Abigail greatly, and so, with that said, they decided to formally arrest her on suspicion of murder. During her interrogation, Abigail decided not to answer any questions, and instead she handed officers a formal statement made by her and her solicitor. Now, Abigail's initial story goes a little something like this. She told officers that Bradley was planning to harm himself, so in response, she grabbed the knife off of him to then throw outside. She then ran down the hallway with a knife in her hand, but Bradley was able to catch up with her, and when he did, he then grabbed her wrist and plunged the knife into his chest. Now, obviously, this was a very weak story, and nobody believed her, and several weeks later, Abigail knew that too, so two months after his death, she finally accepted manslaughter charges. With Abigail now taking partial accountability over Bradley's death, the next big question was, what exactly happened to them on the night that he died? And what were her motives? Well, it all started in the afternoon. Reminiscing over the recent months of his relationship, and with Abigail stabbing him in the arm just one week prior, Bradley realised that he no longer wanted to be in a relationship with her. With his resolve in mind, he asked her to meet him in a public park, and once she arrived, Abigail was enraged to hear his decision. Shortly after 5pm, surveillance cameras captured Bradley, Abigail, and her friends Ryan and Louise arriving at the Horseshoe pub. Shortly after this, they then made their way to the pub's beer garden. Unknown to the others at the time, but Abigail had snorted a line of cocaine just a few minutes prior, and to make things worse, she was now mixing it with alcoholic drinks. Abigail was obviously in a difficult mood, acting both short-tempered and angrily, was causing trouble with other people, and got into several arguments with other punters. During this time, a friend had found Bradley crying in the gent's bathroom, and after asking him what the problem was, Bradley said that he had to get away from Abigail. He admitted that he was scared of her, but unfortunately he couldn't leave either, because he believed that she would try to take her own life again. 
Unfortunately, Abigail's mild aggression escalated throughout the evening to almost uncontrollable levels. She eventually slapped a man she had gotten into an argument with. This resulted in him striking her back. Abigail fell to the ground before being escorted away. The conflict seemed to rile her, as soon after this, Punters witnessed her grabbing Bradley's drink out of his hands and throwing it into his face. Allegedly, she was furious that he didn't stand up against the man who hit her. Getting upset, Bradley told her to calm down while a friend pushed the two apart. Now, clearly Abigail had had enough, and she wanted to go home and be alone with Bradley. His friend told her to stop bullying him, to which, in response, she spat in the friend's face. It was in this moment, at 7.50pm, that a mutual friend, Alfie, offered to give them a lift back home. The two accepted his offer, and it's reported that the couple argued the entire way back. Once they arrived at the property, Abigail stormed inside, while Bradley said goodbye, in which one of the last things he said to Alfie was, I'm dead when I get home. Alfie was concerned. The situation felt distinctly sinister. He therefore decided to give Bradley his mobile phone number, just in case he needed him. He then said his goodbyes, and, not even 20 minutes later, emergency services were called. As mentioned before, although Abigail pleaded guilty to manslaughter charges, she refused to take full accountability, and refused to plead guilty to murder. However, as investigators dug deeper into the case, they found a mountain of concerning information which ruled against her own theories. For example, after combing through Bradley's phone, data analysts found hundreds of threatening messages sent by Abigail in the months prior. On February the 7th, which was one month before his death, Abigail sent Bradley a message to say, I swear to God, I'll stab you. Another message sent just a few weeks prior said, I'm going to stab you in the fucking neck. Now, to be honest with you, Abigail was completely unhinged, and to those who warned Bradley that she was a psycho, they were not far off the ball. In some of these text messages, she even threatened to kill Bradley's mother in front of him, and just six days before his death, she made several Google searches related to stabbing. Moving into the pre-trial phase of this case, Abigail White was medically examined by several professional psychiatrists, and the results were very interesting to say the least. Dr. Sanya Kriez, a clinical psychologist, concluded that Abigail was so poor at controlling her anger, that 99% of the rest of the population would be more able to successfully do it than her. She also concluded that Abigail had a very poor coping strategy for controlling her anger, and had a condition that meant, when roused, the rational thinking part of her brain shut down. Dr. Bradley Hiller, a consultant forensic psychiatrist, told the jury that Abigail appears to suffer from borderline personality disorder, a mental health condition that affects mood stability, causing rapid and extreme swings in mood, with sometimes small or even non-existent triggers. He added that her account of what happened that fateful night was consistent with her having the disorder, with additional traits that affected her emotional stability. Another consultant psychiatrist, Dr. Sanford, conceded that in the days before the incident, Abigail had been experiencing extreme stress due to various external factors, which included an induced abortion, Bradley admitting that he had been unfaithful, and claiming that he was going to leave her. He also concluded that the manifestations of her personality disorder could be heightened as a result, and that she had difficulty controlling her emotions and struggled to control her anger. But it was confirmed that she did not exhibit signs of delusions, hallucinations, or other symptoms consistent with psychosis, and that she had never been a mental health inpatient. Now, Abigail did acknowledge that she had a very tough and controlling relationship with Bradley, but she would also claim that he was the manipulative one, and that he was frequently sleeping with other women behind her back. Bradley isn't here to defend himself against these claims, and therefore, they are best taken with a hefty pinch of salt. And although she claimed that he was just as violent as she was, the only solid evidence of violence between the two was the stab wound to his arm, and his subsequent death just one week later. And it seems that her excuses, lies, and supposed justifications were not enough to persuade the jury either. And after 12 hours of deliberation, they came back with a unanimous verdict. Abigail White was guilty of the murder of Bradley Lewis. As a result, under UK law, Abigail was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 18 years before she could be eligible for parole. This means that, at the very earliest, she may be free in October of 2039. However, she is likely to remain behind bars for much longer after this. In relation to her sentence, the judge remarked, These messages make for a chilling reading, and you demanded almost constant attention. Messages show that when he did not do what you wanted, you became increasingly volatile, and in my judgement, at the time that you stabbed him, you did intend to kill him. 
you had threatened to do this many times. During her trial, Abigail said that she didn't lie about the stabbing to protect herself, but rather instead because she was scared of what might happen to her. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I'm not mistaken, that is the exact same thing. She further told the courtroom, I was worried about what was going to happen to me, to Brad and the family. I just wish I'd told the truth from the beginning. It just happened. Bradley's father shared that losing him was the hardest thing he had ever experienced in his life, such as the overwhelming sense of both grief and pain. And Bradley's mum, Rachel, stated that part of her world ended when police told her that Bradley had died, and that the loss will be with her for the rest of her life. Bradley was well known and appreciated by almost everyone, that is everyone except the one person who he should have been able to trust above all others. And now, not only will his three children never know life with a father anymore, but they will grow up knowing that it was their mother who murdered him. Bradley's death brought so much sadness to his family and the many people who knew him, and the hundreds of people who attended his funeral showed ample proof of this. In honour of his life, family and friends from his years at Bristol Rovers Supporters Football Club played a friendly football match against Hallen FC. Not only did hundreds of people sign up to watch the event, but more than £7,000 was raised for his funeral, with the remaining donations going towards MIND, a men's mental health charity. On Friday the 20th of May 2021, Bradley Lewis was cremated at Westerly Crematorium. During this service, one of the football managers that used to train with him when he was a child said, he was one of the nicest kids you could ever meet. Sometimes people say that without actually meaning it, but with Brad, it was genuine. He was very placid, amicable and polite, just one of the good guys in life, like his dad. He will be desperately missed by the many that knew him. Coupled with a very unhealthy mental state, which was allowed to deteriorate over a prolonged period of time, Abigail lost sight of what she had, a loving family, which is something that many would give anything for. By no means were things perfect, including Bradley and his own actions, but it's clear through those around him that he devoted everything he could towards his family. He was a loving father who genuinely tried to make things work over a prolonged period of time, all while simultaneously being scared of Abigail. And Abigail, she abused that fear. And abused is actually an understatement. Not only did she take this man for granted, but she even threatened to take his life, and wounded him when he didn't comply. The warning signs were there for months, and nasty arguments and voice notes aside, she'd even stabbed him just one week prior. But again, and it is worth mentioning that the man felt trapped in the relationship. Although he wanted to leave her and her evil, unhinged clutches, he felt like he couldn't because the two shared children. And eventually, her evil threats became a vicious reality. I'm closing this case up here, folks. Unfortunately, this one has no silver lining. All I hope is that, moving forward, Bradley's family and friends find peace in the future, and that Bradley's children find a happy and fulfilling life in memory of their father. But thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or insightful, then please remember to like the video, and if you haven't yet, subscribe to The Coffee House. And while I'm here, a big thank you to Gordon from Featherwax Studios for putting up the new decorations in our coffee house. Now, if I've timed this correctly, then this video should actually be released on my birthday, and if that's the case, I'm likely sat somewhere right now eating a large chunk of cake. And as soon as I've gotten over this cake coma, I'll be right back for another video. But until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.